start with, the topic is uh, the role of enterprise integration in the digital transformation. So I, I think you all uh, have heard about the importance of digital transformation. And in this talk, uh, I'm going to focus on the importance of enterprise integration uh, when it comes to uh, transforming your business into a digital business. So in this uh, session, we will be uh, mainly discussing about uh, why integration is so important uh, when it comes to digital transformation and existing integration technologies, existing uh, centralized integration middleware and how they have evolved over last uh, several decades and modern trends uh, in the enterprise integration, especially with microservices architecture, where is the integration uh, middleware heading? Uh, because you may have heard about uh, no ESP initiatives coming from microservices architecture. So uh, I'm going to go into the details of uh, how that works in practice with the modern enterprises. And uh, we, we are going to introduce the concept of micro integration, uh, a decentralized integration approach, which is kind of an alternative to the uh, conventional uh, centralized integration. And also, uh, I'll also focus on how Valerina caters these future integration needs uh, during the latter part of the session. <laughs> Okay, so let's get started with uh, the relationship between digital transformation and integration. So as you have heard in the morning, uh, digital transformation is pretty much about uh, uh, enhancing your business, evolve your business models, focusing on e enhancing your customer experiences and optimizing existing business operations with the use of underlying software systems. So as you know, any enterprise uh, that if you take any of the existing enterprise, uh, that is not a greenfield enterprise. And which means you have quite a lot of uh, systems, existing systems, uh, services, data. So likewise, uh, there are a lot of uh, systems which are already existing and already catering some part of your business. And you need, if you need to transform your entire business uh, into a digital business, so that's where you have to integrate all these uh, disparate systems, services, data, uh, and also some external services in order to build new business functionalities. So therefore, uh, enterprise integration is uh, one of the key steps towards building a digitally transformed business. So what is enterprise integration? I think most of you have heard about uh, enterprise integration, so that is nothing new in it. It is pretty much about plumbing different systems, services, data, uh, web APIs, and forming new business solutions. So this particular definition uh, that I got from Forrester, so it, uh, it introduced enterprise integration as a technology for developing, maintaining, testing, deploying, and governing interfaces between different applications, machines, and databases. So uh, one important aspect of this definition is uh, here, it only, uh, here it talks about uh, not only the developing and deploying part, but also the entire life cycle. So, so all the modern enterprise integration sol solution has to cater the end-to-end -end life cycle, uh, all these life cycle states of the enterprise integration. So, We'll come back to the uh, come back to these points later uh, when it comes to WS2 integration platform. So, enterprise integration is a, is a not is not a new thing. It's a it's a very old concept, probably several decades old, and still we are talking about it. Still, we are building new solutions, new platforms to cater enterprise integration needs. So, why enterprise integration is so important uh, nowadays? So uh, enterprise integration has evolved from different architectural concepts such as EAI, uh, ESB with SOA, and now it has uh, uh, evolved up to the microservices and how microservices communicate with each other. And the importance of uh, enterprise integration is, uh, is very critical nowadays, especially due to the uh, increasing usage of uh, APIs. 
APIs in the sense uh, web APIs, cloud services, software as a service applications. Uh, at the same time, uh, a lot of IoT devices coming into the picture. You need to integrate uh, different types of uh, data representation within your enterprise as well as still there are a lot of proprietary systems, legacy systems. So likewise, uh, enterprise integration is moving to a much more dynamic space uh, than it was uh, there before and therefore we need to rethink our enterprise integration strategies, uh, not just as an enterprise middleware vendor, but as an enterprise, uh, we need to uh, concentrate on modern trends in enterprise integration. So in order to cater the uh, conventional enterprise integration needs, uh, the uh, standard solution that most of the uh, middleware, integration middleware vendors came up with was uh, centralized integration, the enterprise service bus, the central integration bus that connects all the different systems. So this is based on the conventional ESP approach and, we, and this is capable of uh, connecting legacy systems to proprietary systems, cloud services, data applications. So likewise, all different types of things uh, can be integrated using this central middleware. So, as with most of the uh, other uh, integration middleware vendors, WSO2 also offers a uh, uh, rich set of enterprise integration products, which includes WSO2 ESB, uh, WSO2 Business Process Server, Data Services Server, Message Broker. Likewise, uh, there is a set of products that are uh, categorized under WSO2 integration platform. So what we have done with the new uh, Enterprise Integrator 6.0 product, uh, it's, it's a more or less a new packaging, uh, a packaging of a set of existing products and make sure they are fully uh, seamlessly connected and we, we basically want to enhance the user experience so that uh, users don't have to download uh, various uh, discrete set of products and build their solutions. Uh, and if you look at the Enterprise Integrator 6.0, uh, it primarily caters the central, centralized uh, integration needs. Uh, this will be the central place that all the other systems connects to. And uh, there are a set of uh, important aspects related to the runtime. So uh, just to clarify, this is not a single monolithic uh, distribution uh, or single monolithic runtime that has all the features and when you start the product, you don't get all the runtimes into the same runtime. So that is not uh, that. This is just a packaging, a packaging of set of products. And if you look at the runtime structure, uh, ESP and data services server is merged into the single runtime. Because what we have seen with most of our customers is that uh, most people use DSS as a feature embedded into the ESP, owing to the carbon platform features. So in the runtime aspect, ESP and data services will be a single runtime. You have message broker, business process server, application server, and ESP analytics as separate runtimes. So, and, and also we are changing, slightly changing the positioning of uh, uh, these three products, message broker, business process server, and application server, because we are not positioning message broker as a enterprise, uh, if, it's not a generic message broker that you can go and uh, use. If you have, say, uh, JMS or MQTT requirements, uh, message queuing requirements, this is not the broker that you should go to, but rather this is a, more or less a supporting product for the uh, other part of your, your integration. Let's say you need to uh, build a guaranteed delivery scenario with, uh, with your uh, business use case. So then uh, ESB can seamlessly connect to the message broker and uh, use that for in implementing, the, implementing the guaranteed delivery scenario. And, and same thing applies for the business process server. So there is, uh, rather than positioning this as a pure business uh, process execution engine, this will be a supporting product for your integration. Because you are, uh, let's say your integration scenario has quite a lot of other integration uh, connectors and all that and some part of the integration scenario needs business processes, workflows or something like that. So again, that's where the business process 
uh, capabilities fits in. So, so I'm not going into the details of the enterprise integration integrator because Dushan will go into the details of the runtime and the capabilities that we have included in the latest uh, releases uh, and also the ESP5 uh, related features. And uh, I'm going to pretty much concentrate on the overall aspect of how integration has evolved. So the question is can conventional uh, integration middleware survive with the modern architectural paradigms, uh, emerging architectural paradigms such as microservices containers. So if you look at the modern uh, integration needs, there, there is a drastic change, uh, especially when it comes to the way you deploy, where you uh, design your services, domain uh, driven design, etc. So there is a significant change that uh, you have to in, uh, incorporate when it comes to designing new uh, systems. And, and also uh, the, the features, the design, the vision behind most of the existing uh, integration middleware is pretty much like a decade or so old. So therefore we need to rethink uh, enterprise integration middleware with respect you to the existing uh, uh, like uh, emerging architectural concepts such as container architecture and microservices. So, uh, so I would like to go through some of the future integration needs and then uh, discuss about the microservices architecture and the relationship between the integration. So let's start with uh, the growth and the diversity of integration needs. So uh, although integration is not so new thing, the integration, uh, the growth of the number of integrations that you have to do is, in, is increasing, especially with the APIs and uh, software as a service applications and IoT, there is a significant growth in, uh, in the number of integration that you have to do uh, in order to build a business uh, use case. And also, not just the growth, but, the, but also the diversity. Uh, you, you may be, uh, maybe like several years ago, you may be integrating some set of RESTful services and some uh, databases. Now, it has changed uh, so that you have to integrate different APIs, discrete set of APIs, different SaaS, SaaS applications, and also at the same time, you need to integrate your existing proprietary systems, the B2B integration or legacy systems. So likewise, there is a significant growth and diversity when it comes to integration needs. And the other aspect is the agility and ease of integration. So if you look at most of the existing integration pro projects, uh, when it comes to uh, realizing a given business use case, you more or less spend more time on connecting systems, uh, connecting systems, services, data, etc., than you uh, focusing on your actual business use case. So that is the ground reality with most of the uh, software pro projects because you are more or less uh, spending your energy on in integrating these systems. So that's why uh, we need to have a solution, we need to have an integration solution that can connect uh, disparate systems quickly and how easily, how, how easily you can explain the integration to a different, a new user. So likewise, there are a lot of things uh, coming into the pictures, things like visual modeling, debugging, troubleshooting, and analytics. Uh, so this, is, this won't be like the traditional visual modeling. We need to rethink our uh, integration strategies beyond uh, the existing visual modeling tools. So the next point is orchestration. Again, this is not a new thing. This has been there for, again, uh, ever since the start of the uh, enterprise integration. Uh, orchestration has also changed uh, during last several years because uh, uh, orchestration is pretty much about orchestration between couple of services when it comes to the ESB uh, scenarios. But now it has changed mainly due to the proliferation of services. Uh, there is a uh, and also the APIs and other applications that you have to integrate. Uh, people tends to uh, build fine-grained services. Uh, services, uh, you may 
uh, you may identify a given set of uh, business requirements and you will build a lot of fine grain services. So, when you have to build a business functionality, you have to integrate all these fine grain services and therefore, the orchestration is uh, getting even more complex uh, in the modern integration scenarios. And orchestra orchestration uh, looks really, uh, it is really hard to uh, represent visually, uh, especially with the existing data flow uh, visual modeling tools. So, just to give an example, uh, orchestration scenario. So, this is from uh, Netflix uh, API uh, usage. So, a single call to the next Netflix API triggers uh, 9 different uh, backend service calls and the service orchestration logic resides in the Netflix API. So, likewise, uh, the number of services and uh, number of external orchestrations that you have to do has increase uh, drastically. And, uh, and also when it comes to uh, integration technologies, uh, there is a need to integrate not just uh, uh, services, not just data. So, there is a uh, requirement to integrate different types of uh, applications, data and also identity. And uh, especially when you have I two different identity management systems, how do you integrate these two identities and federate them under one uh, using one, one system. And also the API gateway and API composition is also becoming a key aspect of modern enterprises. So, likewise there are the integration needs, also there are diverse set of uh, areas that you need integration. So, th these may be uh, implemented at, as uh, different solutions, but they have similar uh, attributes. <coughs> then performance, uh, again performance, uh, uh, what from our experience, what we have seen uh, over the last several years was, uh, if you look at a given customer, the number of calls that they are supporting using uh, WS2 middleware has increased from uh, uh, ever since we started deploying our systems in, 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 in a given customer. So, for example, this is uh, this denotes a growth of a number of API calls for a given API. Uh, so, likewise the ever in, there is a ever increasing growth uh, of API calls that you have to support in the future. And also performance has a, a totally different perspective when it comes to container architecture. Uh, performance is not just uh, the number of transactions and the latency uh, of your runtime, but uh, the startup time, memory footprint, uh, the distribution size, likewise all the other attributes are becoming even more important in uh, the performance in container mode. So, uh, so that is why uh, and if you take any of the existing middleware, integration middleware, uh, they, they more or less does not fit into the container architecture. Uh, startup times are around like more than, uh, I would say more than 30 seconds, uh, very high memory footprints. Likewise, uh, I can safely say that most of the existing uh, integration middleware does not really container friendly, including WSO2 of course. <coughs> and scalability. Uh, uh, scalability wise again uh, containers are coming into the picture. Uh, scalability requirements has changed so that uh, let us say that you have two different APIs, one is shopping API, one is checkout API uh, and you are getting more traffic into your shopping API. You need to independently scale uh, your shopping API uh, instances like container instances without uh, scaling the other existing services. So, uh, you need to have much more granular way of scaling and you need to therefore, you need to build your integration scenarios so that they can uh, independently scale. And the, the reality with the most of the existing centralized integration solutions is you deploy all your integration into the same integration runtime but you cannot independently scale uh, your system for a given integration use case. So, uh, 
So now uh, let's discuss uh, about the microservices and ESB uh, related uh, arguments that we have in, in most of the enterprises. So uh, what we have seen, uh, especially during last couple of years, is the increasing adaptation of microservices architecture. So and and also, if using an ESB is kind of a becoming an, an anti-pattern. Uh, some some people think it's an anti-pattern, and we should not use ESB. So there are a lot of myths around that as well. But uh, let's try to uh, analyze the real uh, the usage of microservices and integration and see what, what is the best solution to solve the integration problem with uh, microservices. So, so obviously microservices architecture rejects CSB. So that is actually, this is from uh, Martin Fowler's uh, suggestions, uh, smart endpoints and dumb pipes. So, uh, so no ESB at all. Uh, his recommendation is to move the uh, business logic plus the routing logic and uh, spread it across all the other clients, which are smart endpoints. So this is the theoretical aspect of microservices and uh, most of the integration middleware vendors and uh, when it comes to practical usage of microservices, uh, they don't really, this, uh, they find this really problematic. Although this works in theory when it comes to practical usage, uh, this will basically results the, the very same point to point spaghetti thing that we were trying to get rid of uh, using uh, ESB, right? So this is a scenario that I like, uh, several microservices and try to uh, integrate using Martin Fowler's way. So you will end up getting a spaghetti kind of architecture. So this will work for like three or four services, but as I said earlier, uh, you can't really uh, say that your business uh, scenarios only need this many services. And also the, uh, the downside of that is uh, uh, you still have to integrate your, with your existing ERP system. Let's say you have SAP system. So are you going to write SAP integration code in your microservices? No, that is not going to work, right? So we need a better way to, uh, actually we need to evaluate what uh, microservices architecture, the, what organization who has adopted microservices architecture has done. So again, going back to the Netflix uh, use case, uh, as I said earlier, for a single uh, API call, uh, there is an orchestration happens. So what they have done is at the API uh, layer, the gateway layer, they have implemented the orchestration logic. So basically the orchestration between these nine services is implemented at the API gateway layer. So that's not a smart endpoint, right? This is a, this is not a smart endpoint. There is the logic, business logic implemented at the gateway. So in theory, they are not using microservices at all, right? So, uh, and also this is from Uber. Uh, uh, Uber, they had the old way where they have the monolithic system uh, and they split that into three different services. This is one of their use case. And, uh, and when it comes to the orchestration, they are using the edge services. Again, very similar to the API gateway thing. Uh, and the orchestration logic is implemented at this point. So, so the point is, uh, so what we are saying is we, we are not going to introduce the ESB into the picture, but we need to think about a decentralized integration uh, frameworks, uh, 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 an integration framework that allows you to integrate uh, existing services, systems, and data, and and that framework should cater the modern inter enterprise integration need, especially the container architecture and also the microservices architecture, architectural principles. So with the decentralized integration middleware or frameworks, uh, there is no central uh, integration bus that, uh, that will shared by all, the, all of your use cases, integration use cases, uh, rather this, this provides a framework to build, build independent integration scenarios 
and uh, we use the term micro integrations or integration microservices to denote this kind of integrations. So let's try to uh, define micro integration. Uh, so this the so actually the term that uh, I think that we came up with this term uh, based on uh, different experiences. But micro integration or integration microservices, the key aspect of that is building a specific integration scenario and run that run that integration scenario as an independent uh, independent runtime using a lightweight integration framework. And we will have only one integration scenario per each runtime and this runtime has to be extremely lightweight lightweight in the sense it has to be container native it should start up within uh, like less than within couple of seconds uh, it should have low memory footprint and uh, and this uh, runtime has to be able to deploy develop deploy and scale independently. So let's have a look at some of the uh, micro integration scenarios. So let's assume that you, ha you are a greenfield uh, uh, startup or something and you have uh, four different microservices. You can still use the spaghetti integration and client can directly talk to the microservices. Uh, that is possible but uh, often when you have like uh, hundreds of microservices uh, this will become a spaghetti integration. So, therefore, what you can do is you can build your different micro integrations. Uh, you can pick and choose the, the fine grain or atomic microservices that you want to integrate with and you build the micro integration using the micro integration framework. And uh, so likewise, you can build multiple integration scenarios. So these are uh, fully container native. They can independently scale. And we can extend the same thing. We can do the same thing for the conventional enterprises. Like uh, this is a conventional uh, integration use case. You have an ERP system, Salesforce, data and services. And again, you can do the same thing using the micro integration framework. So this basically replaced the central ESP that we had in the middle. Again, the importance is, uh, uh, also, you can use the hybrid approach, which is this is the most common thing that we have seen with the modern enterprises, because you cannot really migrate all your existing software systems to microservices. So therefore, you have set of uh, existing proprietary or legacy and monolithic systems, and uh, you have maybe some new projects are implemented as microservices, and you need to have some kind of a federated integration between these two ecosystems. And again, microservices, micro integration fits into the, uh, that use case as well. So this is the in important aspect of that. You have, uh, uh, say you have three different integration scenarios and you can independently scale them just by changing the number of instances that you're going to use for a given integration scenario, you can scale them independently. So scaling, uh, deploying, developing, deploying and scaling independently. And types of uh, micro integration, uh, often t in most cases micro integrations are more or less exp exposing a REST API, uh, RESTful interface to the external world. And also there can be scenarios which are not exposing anything. Those are like uh, scheduled jobs. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a scheduled job that is running periodically. Uh, things like, for example, if you want to sync data between Salesforce and SAP, so that can be done through a schedule execution. So, and also API part, I'll, I'll come back to the uh, come back to that in the next couple of slides. And uh, uh, so, when it comes to API, API gateway and integration, so there is a, a very close relationship. Uh, because uh, some organization uh, wants to have separate API gateway layer and some organization wants to have, a, uh, have the API, gate, API gateway and integration at the same level. So uh, again, API is primarily used for exposing your business functionalities to the external world. And there is a whole, sort, whole lot of other API related stuff like API store, publisher, 
and uh, building an API ecosystem. So, that is a different story, but uh, here we are talking about the API uh, gateway aspect of uh, API management. So, it is more or less becoming the monolith because uh, uh, for, for the most of the organization who claims to have microservices architecture, they have a central API gateway. So, it is becoming the new monolith. So, just to give a uh, very recent uh, uh, architectural change that Netflix did. So, this came I think during last year Q4. So, they had a central uh, API gateway layer which is the monolithic layer and uh, they actually face some issues when it comes to uh, two different APIs. They want to uh, develop and deploy these APIs independently, but since their orchestration layer is monolithic, they cannot do that. So, basically they had to split the gateway layer into two different parts. So, again that is that is a good example to prove that most of the API gateways are becoming the monolith. So, we need to cater that aspect as well. So, that means uh, the API composition layer or API gateway layer has to uh, needs to be uh, able to scale independently. That means, uh, let us say you have two different APIs deployed and you should be able to scale those two uh, APIs independently at the API gateway layer. Okay, so, how WSO2 is addressing all the things that I have discussed so far. Obviously, uh, uh, so what we have been working during last uh, couple of last year or so is to address all these needs using a, a new solution. So, we do not really want to build a, just another ESP again. So, we, we have evaluate all these uh, requirements and we need to build a actually a reusable integration framework that can use for uh, all these types of integration. And also the visual and textual representation is equally important. As I said earlier, we do not we really want to move away from the traditional uh, data flow model. And the uh, ultimate answer is ballerina. So, this is uh, our next generation uh, integration framework or the programming language that allows you to integrate different systems. So, I think some of the things that you have already uh, heard in the morning, it is a new programming language with textual and uh, graphical syntax and uh, we based we are based on the sequence diagramming uh, programming model, model. That means, uh, any given integration scenario has to be able to uh, represent using a sequence diagram. And, uh, it is network aware, data aware likewise uh, uh, we inspired uh, quite a lot of stuff from uh, Go. And uh, <coughs> so, there is a uh, important aspect of graphical and uh, textual parity that means, you can switch between uh, graphical and textual representation. Uh, you can choose either way to develop your integrations and it has deep integration for rest because our all our concepts are based on pretty much based on a restful uh, interface concept. And it offers different connectors and the good thing is uh, since this is a programming language there are, you do not really need to use weird uh, expression languages. For example, most of the ESB vendors have their own expression languages how to retrieve properties and all that. You do not really have to do that because this is a, a programming language you have the actual uh, programming syntax in it. And also, uh, if you look at the concept that we have incorporated, uh, we have uh, the service, most of the things uh, we got from RESTful integration concept, uh, the service concept, resources, uh, workers, uh, likewise uh, all the things that you heard uh, in the morning. So, how does we address these uh, the future integration requirements that we have discussed so far? So, if you look at the orchestration, it it is becoming much more simpler with the new visual representation. So, you have uh, different types of uh, services that you are integrating with and you represent them uh, in the form of a sequence diagram using our new uh, ballerina composer. And uh, so, this is actually not that interesting because this is sequential, 
But uh, we more or less uh, more and more seeing this type of uh, multi-worker execution. Uh, there are a lot of multiple parties uh, participating in your integration scenario. So, you can uh, basically uh, similar to what we have done in the morning, you send uh, multiple requests to different API calls and all things happen uh, in parallel. So, likewise uh, you, you really need to think the modern integration scenarios in more parallel way. So, that you have multiple workers ex executing in parallel and, and also you are continuing, your own thread is continuing with your own integration and once you are done with that, you can basically wait till all the other jobs completed. <coughs> and also the connectivity is a key aspect of Ballerina. So, that means, uh, since we are building integration, uh, we, since we are going to support all types of integration, the server connectors, client connectors are quite important. The inbound uh, protocols are catered with the server connectors and outbound uh, integrations are handled with the client connectors. And also, uh, we have connectors for different uh, web APIs including Twitter, Gmail, etc. And when it comes to integration solutions, EIP is uh, is an important aspect and what we have found with the ballerina is uh, most of the EIPs are already there in our language like they are integral part of the language. For example, if for join for each etc, those are part of the language and we will, uh, we will continue to uh, improve the language so that we can cover 100 percent coverage of all EIPs. And type mapping, so we have the basic type mapping support in the uh, editor, the, in the composer as well as in the language using uh, the type uh, uh, mapping concept. And also the performance, uh, if you look at, uh, so actually one of the motivation behind building Ballerina is, uh, is actually performance. So even before we build Ballerina, we build our new HTTP transport using Netty which is pretty much like 5 percent, 5 x faster than the existing uh, HTTP transport. And likewise, we have uh, included uh, various, uh, uh, yes. Yeah, so the question I got is, uh, number one, most of the data representation that you guys keep talking about is XML and JSON. Mm -hmm. But uh, in looking into your ESP and the mapping, I was trying to find an easier way to implement either PFF or PFF. Yeah, so, uh, so uh, shall I take the questions after the session? Sure. Okay, yeah. Right, so uh, th when it comes to performance, uh, the other aspect of the performance is the uh, startup time and all that. So, if you look at, if you try out Ballerina, uh, a given service can start, uh, I think, within less than one second or something. So, it, uh, it varies from machine to machine, but uh, it is pretty much around one to two second time to build, boot up a new service. So, that, that is very container friendly and entire execution model is non-blocking based, uh, including our new uh, Netty transport. And as you have seen in the morning, visual debugging uh, is also part of the language, uh, part, part of the composer as well. And uh, And scaling, again, uh, you can scale, uh, scale the uh, runtime based on uh, number of instances that you boot up. So, basically, you start up uh, a given uh, micro integration with Ballerina and you basically scale only that scenario. Yeah, maybe I can answer your question in the meantime. So, uh, so your question is about the existing ESB or the uh, Ballerina? Well, actually both. Both, yeah. Right. Right, yeah. So, I think for the, for Ballerina this will be quite straightforward as it's a new data type 
representation within the language. So, we can easily plug that in. For the existing ESBs, uh, we will uh, ESB architecture, we will still have to use the, uh, the canonical data format that we are using and write a connector or a message builder and formatter to format this uh, different types of protocols. So, uh, yeah, we can probably discuss your exact requirement uh, offline. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So basically, what we are suggesting is uh, is to use Ballerina for all types of micro integrations. Uh, there is no really alternative. Especially one of the key aspect of micro integration is the lightweightness and and uh, container nativeness. So, sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, at the runtime level, yeah. So, because of most of the existing solutions are, those are too bulky to be really say, uh, I'm really container friendly. So, at the moment, uh, answer is no, but uh, we, we will soon uh, release the uh, enterprise integrator new version and you should be able to do that with Ballerina. Okay, so this is about Enterprise Integrator 7.0, the upcoming release. So we will be using Ballerina to replace the existing ESB runtime, uh, which includes ESB data services, uh, basically, basically uh, replacing all uh, ESB and data services runtimes. And uh, again, as we mentioned in the morning, we will run both 6 and 7 in parallel. Uh, so you don't really need to worry about if you are already an existing ESB customer. And again, migration, we, we believe that we can uh, cover 80% of the integration uh, migration to, to, through automated tools. And again, EI6 will be continue to release and enhanced. So quick overview about the hybrid integration uh, strategies. So we have the integration cloud available at the moment. So you can, uh, you can build any of the integration scenarios that we build with ESB5 and you can do that uh, in the WC2 integration cloud. Okay, so this is a summary. So in summary, the integration middleware uh, is not disappearing. Rather, they are morphing to new uh, integration uh, middleware frameworks uh, which leverage micro integration. And we believe that uh, within next uh, several years, micro integration will rule the world, and uh, Ballerina-based uh, uh, enterprise integrator will cater all the micro integration uh, needs.